Good evening. In the next episode of uh, Oppo Stories uh, from the NBA, uh, my today guest is uh, Jim McIlwain. Hello, Jim. Hello. Nice, nice to have it uh, in my podcast. Uh, uh, Jim uh, uh, was uh, Seattle SuperSonics and uh, Washington uh, Bullets and New Jersey Nets uh, player during his uh, NBA career, but. Before I will start, um, ask you about um, about your MBA career. I would like to ask about something from the past. So, uh, who was your favorite player when you were a kid? Uh, Sports Illustrated, when it was still worth buying, it was a magazine in the United States. Uh, they sold posters out of the back of the magazine, and everybody I knew. Uh, all my friends that were into basketball and football and baseball, they, they sold basketball, football, baseball, and hockey posters. And uh, I only had the basketball posters, but um, I remember I had Dr. J, Julius Irving, and Marcus Johnson, and Brian Winters, who both played for the Milwaukee Bucks. They were posters hanging in my room. <coughs> Excuse me. And I also, uh, I really like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and uh, Wilt Chamberlain a lot too, even though um, I never got to see Wilt Chamberlain play. I also got Guinness Books of World Records when I was a kid. Uh, they had these programs where you could buy books when you went to school and I'd buy these world record books and invariably I'd look up the tallest people in the world and because I was taller than everybody in my class and then I'd start looking up the basketball records. And at the time, Will Chamberlain held all the basketball records. So I thought that was just the coolest thing ever, even though he basically had retired uh, by the time I was old enough to even pay attention to basketball. But I got to watch Julius Irving and Kareem and Marcus Johnson and Brian Winters. And, and Marcus actually later on went on to uh, be the color commentator on the Sonics broadcasts with Kevin Calabro. And I got to meet him and know him, and it was fantastic. He was a childhood hero of mine and still a hero of mine. Mm -hmm. And when was this moment uh, when you were a kid uh, that you were taller than uh, the others um, kids in the neighborhoods and in your class and uh, your coaches told you that, uh, Jim, definitely you need to play basketball? Well, I was taller than everybody from birth, basically. I was 24 inches when I was born, 10 pounds, 10 ounces. And uh, never really looked back, but it was it was obvious. Second grade was the first year I played organized basketball, and uh, I guess my daughter is getting a second grade now. And the only thing she's played so far is soccer, and she doesn't like basketball, doesn't care for it. Uh, same thing with volleyball, which her mom played, in addition to basketball. But we'll uh, we'll try to ease the kids into it. Um, but for me, it was a, a social thing. I. I went to a school on the other side of town from where I lived because uh, they had kindergarten and the, the Catholic parochial school on my side of town did not have kindergarten. And I had a younger brother. So my mom wanted us to go to a Catholic school and uh, Saint, she, she sent us to, uh, she sent me for first grade to uh, um, a Polish Catholic school, which turned out really to be a, a Polish Catholic monsignor and priest and it was i was like one of maybe four or five white kids in the whole school saint stanislaus and the rest of the, the kids were all black and so i was kind of very much the outsider um and it was a pretty random apartment what's that do you know some, some polish words uh yeah my mom was polish kielbasa <laughs> and babushka and And not much beyond that. I probably picked up as much Romanian from playing with George Mirosan as I okay. did Polish. Um, um, and I was actually, I was just looking at uh, Ancestry.com today. And uh, my DNA drops me right in Eastern, you know, Eastern Europe, uh, Poland and uh, Germany regions. Um, so then I went to uh, the Bohemian Parish the next year, St. John Nepomuk which turned out really to be just a mixed match of everything. But the kids played basketball, and it was a social thing. I didn't really play sports up until that point. My parents were never into sports, uh, but I picked it up at, at school and kind of embraced it because it 
it was a good way to make friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, how looks your journey uh, with the basketball in the times before the, the NBA and from the high school uh, to the college? Uh, how tough it was? Uh, okay, you were tall. For sure, it was advantage, but I guess that you uh, met uh, during uh, this journey a lot of uh, players who were centers or power forwards, another taller guy. Uh, how difficult it was before uh, the, the first day you uh, you became the NBA player? Well, you know, it, it's kind of a continual progression. Um, and I, I guess the way I kind of equate it to people is um, the best player you played against in grade school was like the average player you played against in high school. And then the best player you played against in high school was like the average player in college. And then the best player you played against in college maybe made the NBA, but maybe not. And, or maybe they showed up briefly and then vanished and you never saw them again. So it was progressively more difficult um, with each level. Although I will say um, <clears throat> I played with Nick Van Ek against Nick Van Exel in high school. He went to Kenosha St. Joe's and they were in our, our basketball conference. And then uh, I played against Nick Van Exel again in college because he was at Cincinnati while I was at Marquette. <clears throat> so there's some, some exceptions like that, but not many. Um, I think Nick and I, as far as I can remember, were the only NBA players that were in the Metro Conference at the same time. Latrell Sprewell was in high school in Milwaukee, but we didn't play against him in our conference. Um, and then some other guys in Wisconsin, Tony Smith and uh, Terry Porter, Joe Wolf, uh, and there's many more, but those guys came a little bit before me, so I never uh, crossed paths with them until I got to the NBA. So uh, did you before you uh, you've got uh, to being the, in the Seattle SuperSonics roster, did you expect it to uh, to be drafted by NBA team? Yeah, um, you know it was interesting. You, you tried to get a feel for where you're going to be drafted or if you're going to be drafted based on who calls you in to do a workout before the draft and where their picks are. And so I was I worked out, and you can probably check back to see which teams had which picks, but I worked out at Miami and Portland, uh, Cleveland, Milwaukee, Golden State. Um, trying to remember if there was anybody else. There might have been a few more. Basically, anybody who wanted me to work out, I'd, I'd go and work out, except uh, the Knicks called the day before the draft and wanted me to come out to work out for them. I think they had the last either the last two picks in the first round or the last pick in the first round, the first pick in the second round. And my agent said, we're not, you know, at this late hour, we're not going to go out there. Um, so that, that might have been the only team that I didn't go work out for. But uh, the Bullets drafted me, and they didn't even work me out. Um, they had scouts who had watched me in college. And um, I think most teams will tell you, even going into the lottery, they'll take the best player available in a lot of cases. And the Bullets felt at that point in the draft, I was the best player available. And uh, they, they already had centers in George Mirasan and Kevin Duckworth, but um, Kevin was at the end of his career and uh, his, he was starting to get some uh, nagging injuries. And George Mirasan was at the beginning of his career, but Uh, no one knew because no one had ever seen a seven foot seven, you know, 350 pound NBA player before. No one knew how long his body would last and how it would hold up in the NBA. So uh, I think I was a good insurance policy. And how it was to be um, in the same team with uh, Gorga Murasan and uh, playing against him uh, during the practice? Uh, what did you learn from him? I learned how to avoid his elbows. Um, <laughs> When, when he turns to shoot in his natural shot motion, his elbows were going to come around and swing right into my face, which was not a common thing um, to, the, to the extent that it happened with George. Um, so it was a challenge, um, but he's just such a big body. And 
I just tried to, you know, and, and I came into the NBA at 240 pounds, so I was probably giving up about 140 pounds to him. Uh, I just tried to push him as far away from the basket as I could before he got the ball, then try to make a shot further away from the basket and uh, tried to contest it to the degree that I could and make it a more difficult shot and block it when I could, but that didn't happen very often. Um, and then uh, I just tried to outrun him down to the other end of the floor because for – as hard as it was to guard him, uh, the one thing I could do was beat him down the floor. And they didn't look for me very often when I did that, but I, I knew at least in practice when I got him to run down the floor quickly, uh, he was going to get tired. And then he'd miss more if he was tired and, and make me look better defensively. And cover to us, too, to, what kind of memories uh, do you got from uh... – Uh, your uh, rookie seasons, uh, besides uh, Jorge Mures on elbows? <laughs> well, I have all kinds. Um, it was kind of a whirlwind. Um, but I remember going to the, the press conference after Jawan Howard and I were drafted, and they showed us the locker room, and they, tra they shared a training room with the Washington Capitals hockey team, which seemed odd to me. But I didn't know if that was common or not in the NBA. And it turned out it wasn't common. Um, but um, the lockers at the Cap Center, which was renamed the U.S. Air Arena, and at Bowie State were not nearly as nice as what I, the locker rooms were terrible, basically, that compared to what I had in college. And Juwan Howard said the same thing. And they were, they were old. They were from whenever that building was built. And we practiced at a gym at Bowie State University that Bowie State wouldn't even use anymore because they built a new gym. So it was, it was a very low-budget uh, production by NBA standards even at that time. Um, we flew private. I think the Spurs maybe were the only team left that flew commercial planes because there was a rule you had to – take like the next available flight out if you had games within a certain time frame and so some of these um like back-to-back -back type games the spurs would have to leave at like a on, on like a 5 30 flight the next morning after a game because that's the next available flight and it's an nba rule so they eventually got a charter plane but we had a regular uh u.s air 737 and it had eight first class seats well there was more than eight guys on the team And the oldest guys, like Scott Skiles, were the shortest guys. And then the youngest guys, like George Mearson and myself, were the biggest guys. And Scott Skiles, to his credit, said, I'm not going to sit up in first-class seats because the, the players were supposed to get the first-class seats, all the first-class seats that were available. Where there was only eight for, you know, 12 to 15 players. So Scott Skiles said, I'm not sitting in that seat and making George Mearson sit and coach. And there, there's just, you know, It was, it was a hard thing to look at and figure out how to do. So what we ended up doing was we let the coaches sit in first class and we took over the coach section and we just pushed down seats in the rows in front of us. And you could sit on two seats and push the two seats in front of you down and throw your legs up on there and then you'd have plenty of room. And that's, that's how we ended up flying. But we had chicken and mushroom sauce for almost every flight because that's what U.S. Air served on for meals on their flight. So it was the exact same meal on every flight because that was the cheap way to do it. And it was probably wrapped into the sponsorship deal with the arena. And um, that's kind of where the recruiting came in for free agents in the NBA because uh, guys like Mark Cuban had just bought the, the uh, Dallas Mavericks and Paul Allen had bought the – Portland Trailblazers and they wanted the biggest newest nicest jets and they ate on like China with silverware and they had delicious meals prepared by a chef not heated up in a microwave and you know the locker rooms were fantastic I think Mark Cuban got in trouble for um, giving players DVD players at the time because that was considered a benefit outside of their contract and other teams complained but Some of these teams, Phoenix was one, I think, they would put out these really nice buffets, like post-game, pre-game, and you'd come in and play against these other teams and see how nicely they treated the, the opposing team, and it got into your head, like, if they treat the, the enemy this well, how, how well do they treat their own people? So um, you figured out pretty quickly which teams you wanted to go to and which teams you didn't want to be on, and the, the – I would say the bullets 
and the Nets, and in which I ended up on both of those teams. Great people, great teammates, but just the facilities and the the resources were very limited. Um, and then uh, the San Diego or the the LA Clippers were a team you wanted to avoid as well. Seattle was one of the great teams, great franchises, great people, great owners, great everything. And uh, they had their own plane and their own practice facility. And uh, they didn't feel like you need, you know, you have a world-class practice facility. Why would you want to pack everything up and go to a training camp for a couple of weeks on a substandard floor, you know, instead of a cushioned floor. So that's, you know, those were the kind of things you looked at when you were a free agent, like how well do they take care of their guys? Because you're going to get paid wherever you go, but, you know, how much of a chance do you have to win a championship? And, you know, how well are they going to take care of your body? And, and, and I had some great fortune to have great trainers, athletic trainers, the whole time I was in the NBA, but best was Frank Furtado in Seattle. And he was probably the oldest, but he was, he had a hyperbaric chamber. We had our own before anybody had hyperbaric chambers. And he was at the cutting edge of rehab. And uh, you don't have to look any further than Gary Payton. He kept Gary Payton patched together for all those years he was in Seattle. And Gary played heavy, heavy minutes. But Frank knew how to take care of Gary's body. And he did the same thing to the extent that he could with everybody else, Nate McMillan and, and Sean Kemp and Detlef Shrimp. All these guys played huge minutes but still uh, kept their bodies in one piece because that's the, the toughest part when you play those heavy minutes is – not having your body just completely fall apart on you before the playoffs. Mm -hmm. So I guess that uh, those uh, those issues like uh, facility, uh, the team of uh, chances to win the championship, uh, the long term contract, uh, were were, um, were things which uh, makes you decided to go to Seattle. But of course. Uh, uh, when you came to Seattle, not uh, everyone was happy. Uh, I mean, Sean Kemp and fans, when they looked at your uh, contract, uh, the money you've get, got, but of course, NBA is a business. And if uh, your agent and uh, the team uh, you want to play for and they want you to play for them uh, decided to uh, give you the money, you took the money uh, and will be the stupidity to not design this kind of contract. But I'm really curious about um, how, uh, because one thing is that you've got some skills that you uh, want to uh, play in the good, good team, uh, win a championship. Uh, but uh, there's also the issue which is called money, right? And I just get, I'm just curious, uh, how would your contract influence the uh, situation in the locker room? Because for sure, Sean Kemp wasn't satisfied with this and uh, he complained to, uh, to the management. But did he also complain to you that you've got uh, better money than he did? So Sean and I were always on really good terms. We're still on really good terms. He never had a problem with my contract. Um, And, and most realistic guys in the NBA love it when somebody else signs a big deal. And uh, because that means, you know, if this, if, you know, that guy thinks he's better than you and you signed a big deal, he probably feels like his next contract will be even bigger. So uh, they're, they're just really happy for you. Like I was really happy for Adam Keefe, not that I thought I was better than him, but he signed what I thought was a monster deal and I couldn't have been happier. And because I felt like that was going to raise the, the price of everybody else, and it did. And I was shocked at how much money teams were offering me. And um, Seattle wasn't the highest. Uh, Cleveland uh, offered more than them. And then at the end, Washington offered more than Cleveland and Seattle. But Seattle was in the finals the year before. And at that point, when you make all that money, what you really want to do is win a championship, I would think. You know, it – So, you know, if I wanted to chase all the money, I would have gone to Cleveland or, or stayed in, in Washington. But um, I had friends who played on the Sonics. Steve Scheffler and Craig Elo uh, were on the team with me. But Scheffler was there before I got there. And we have the same agent. And he told me, you know, we everybody talks and compares notes like, how does your team scout? And like, we have scouting reports. I'm like, I used to have those in college. Yeah, we don't have them in Washington. Oh, we've got great scouting reports and we have individual 
you know, breakdowns on every player on the team and tendencies. And it's like, this is crazy. And I mean, it's like you're, you're competing against people who have an unfair advantage. So um, I knew Seattle was a great franchise. The coaching staff was just outstanding. George Carl had Terry Stotts and Dwayne Casey and Bob Weiss. And I mean, Tim Gergerich is the best coach probably ever in the NBA. And he never wanted to be a head coach. He just wanted to work with guys and make them better. And all these guys were on the same staff at the same time. All these guys who ended up either were at one point head coaches or went on to be head coaches in the NBA and, and did pretty well. Um, and, you know, I already mentioned the trainer, Frank Furtado, um, but it was, it was a great franchise and that's where I wanted to go. And, um, you know, the, when, when I look at Sean's situation, it, I see parallels with Scottie Pippen. And Scottie Pippen signed the contract that he did because he was worried about his longevity in the NBA and he wanted safe money to take care of his family and be set for the long run. And my agent knew the business. And I, I can't speak for to the degree that Sean's agent knew the business, but my agent uh, was one of the original NBA agents. And, and he came out of Cincinnati, helped Oscar Robertson in the early days and was in literally in, in the industry for decades and decades. So uh, when I came out as a rookie, um, Washington offered me a three-year contract. And I said, that's great. I'll, I'll be vested for the pension. I'll get pension if I get through those three years. And, and my agent said, we're not going to take the three-year contract. We're going to take a one-year contract. A one year? I mean, that seems like a huge risk. And, and the money's there's not as much money. It's like, don't worry about it. So the, the three-year deal, I think, was like 150, 175, 200, or something like that. Maybe more, maybe 150, 200, 250. Um, so I took the one-year deal for 200,000. And then uh, he explained that after one year at that time, I don't know if it's still the case or not, I became a restricted free agent, which meant I could go sign with any other team I wanted, but the Bullets would have the option to match that contract. And so after my rookie season, I played well enough that um, Kevin McHale offered me a $525,000 contract to go play for the Timberwolves. And, and my agent, again, specified a one-year deal. And I'm like, these people are offering me, you know, multi-year deals for more money. And he said, relax. You have to understand the timing of salary caps. And he said, you don't want to lock yourself in to a long-term deal or a longer-term deal than you need to until you know the money is right. And he believed in my ability and believed that I would continue to show teams that I could add value to their roster. And uh, he didn't, he wasn't confident George Mirasan's body would hold up for another NBA season and it didn't. And there was a stretch right at the end of the second year where I played, I started and played, you know, 35 minutes a night and averaged almost a double double, almost had a triple double against the Bulls in the year they won 72 games. And uh, that got a lot of people's attention. And at the same time, my agent knew that a lot of contracts were expiring and there was going to be a lot of salary cap room around the NBA. So it was going to be a big year for free agents. And if I had signed two contracts, I would become an unrestricted free agent after my second contract, which means I could sign with anyone and the bullets could offer to match it. And I didn't have to return. I could go anywhere I wanted. So that was the plan. Um, I did it again, played a year for 525000 and then after that season, <clears throat> I, I sat in my agent's office as he talked on speakerphone with these teams. And, and he just said, we want a seven-year deal starting at $3 million a year, going up 20% a year. And I was waiting for teams to like laugh and hang up on them. And they didn't. And they were interested. And it was one after another. And teams were trying to make trades to make room to bring, bring more cap space in so they could sign me. And and uh, it was it was amazing. I didn't, you know, I, I didn't think it would happen like that, but it did. And and with Seattle, it was pretty straightforward. Wally Walker um, said, "Okay, we'll do that." And and my agent said, "Do you want to go there?" He said, "There's no state income tax, so you'll make more money there than you would with any of these other teams that have state income tax." And they just went to the championship, and um, they. You know, they're, they're not going to re-sign Irvin Johnson. He's going to go somewhere else. They're worried about his knees. And I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll go to Seattle. I want to play on that team. And the way Steve Scheffler talks about it, 
it's a great team. And it was, it was a great team. And, and man, it was a lot of fun playing on that team. I really, really enjoyed those years. And I, I, I missed the guys from the bullets that I, you know, spent the last two years with, especially Derek Smith, who was like an older brother to me. And I call these people Grinker guys. His agent was my agent, Ron Grinker. And when he was a NBA player and he took me under his wing in Washington and, and gave me confidence when confidence was at a premium. And that's, that's really what drives the success or failure of a lot of NBA players is self-confidence and, and the ability of, for you to make sure that your teammates and your, your coaches have confidence in your ability and are, are willing to play you. So um, I really loved having Derek Smith as, a, as an assistant coach. And, and it was hard to leave, not because um, – of the money, not because of the facilities, but because of the people that the coaching staff and the players in Washington, I really grew attached to and, and uh, still keep in touch with several of them to this day. And, uh, but Seattle was a tremendous opportunity because it was a playoff team. And that's, that's really, you know, I wanted to climb the mountain. I wanted to go to the very top and, and try to win a championship with the team. So that seemed like my best opportunity to do that. And, and, you know, to the extent that Sean had a deal, you know, Gary Payton was a free agent, and um, the way the, the Larry Bird rule worked was uh, you could sign, re-sign your own guys for whatever you want and exceed the cap. But once you hit the cap, you couldn't re-sign your own guys. Um, or wait a minute. So the, you, could, you could re-sign your own guys and exceed the cap, but if, if you already capped out, you couldn't sign any other free agents. So... Gary had to wait to sign his deal until after I signed my deal because then they could go over the cap to sign Gary. But if they signed Gary first, then they couldn't go over the cap to sign me. Um, so Sean had locked into his deal, um, I don't know, a year or two prior or whenever it was. It seemed like a pretty good deal at the time, I guess. But as the money escalated, it looked like less and less of a good deal over time. And um, I think Eric Montross might have a similar deal because he signed a rookie contract that was pretty long. His dad was an attorney and he represented him and he locked him in at a long-term deal. And, you know, maybe the money would have been a whole lot bigger for Eric if he had waited a year or two more. But at the same time, there's another guy, Bill Curley, who played at Boston College and was drafted, I think, by the Pistons in, in the first round. Mm -hmm. And and uh, he didn't, he kind of, and, and Eric Mobley, uh, actually, the Bucks picked him instead of me. And those guys kind of flamed out after a couple of years in the NBA. And so, you know, maybe it was a, a good idea that they signed as long-term contracts as they, they did because they, they weren't, didn't have another opportunity to make more money after that. So um, you became a Sonic uh, player uh, with a big contract. So uh, you were, uh, you look in your uh, future with the, with this uh, relief and feel of safety for sure. But what about uh, being in the Seattle and playing for the great coach, as you mentioned, George Carl, uh, playing with the Hall of Fame uh, point guard, Gary Payton, and Sean Kemp, uh, and the other really great uh, role players. Uh, how do you remember this, uh, this time spent in Seattle? Well, you know, I I played with Hall of Famers in Seattle, but I played with Hall of Famers, I think, everywhere I, I went. I was fortunate in that regard. But Seattle was by far the most prepared and just the smartest team. And not that I played for dumb people elsewhere, but they, they were on the very cutting edge of what I experienced. Now, maybe Dallas or Portland who were pouring all kinds of resources into their teams had more that I didn't know about because I never played for them. But man, Seattle was so good in every regard. They, they didn't cut corners anywhere. Um, they took really good care of us. Um, they had a guy, a juice guy, who came in after every practice, every game made fresh squeezed juice for us. And they had supplements for us, try to keep us healthy. And they'd, they'd set them out of our locker after every game. And, um, you know, it, That may seem like a little thing, but it, it's like when you when you understand the mentality of an NBA player, it's an important thing because that that cup of juice and those supplements you take might be the best things that you put into your body for the next 24 hours because a lot of NBA guys are young 
you know, they're basically young kids and they're going to go out and put a bunch of garbage into their body, burgers and fries and whatever, and, and probably not eat healthy until they get later in their career. And they start looking for ways to stay healthy and, and stay in the league. But Seattle was fantastic. They had a massage team that would offer massages at the facility after practices. And it was just, you know, it was a world of difference. I, I was paying out of pocket for a, a massage therapist in Washington and having to drive to the guy's house just to get massages to help, you know, loosen up my legs. And, and New Jersey had a massage therapist that traveled on the road with the team as well. But Seattle was just cutting edge in, in every regard. Their practice facility was fantastic. Their weight room was fantastic. Um, and Rich Delatry in New Jersey was an outstanding strength and conditioning coach. And he had a, a really good facility too, but Seattle had some, some stuff that was expensive. Um, they had a treadmill that you could run on that was, um, it, it reduced the body weight. So if you're re rehabbing from a knee injury, you wouldn't put 100% of your body weight on the treadmill as you were trying to run to get back in shape. They had, they had a lot of expensive stuff that I think a lot of other teams were hesitant to purchase, but they used it and offered it to the guys and it was taken advantage of it. They, you, you felt all the confidence in the world heading out to play a game when you were on the Sonics because you knew, you knew the other team as well as they did probably. You knew your job, you knew your own teammates, and you were as prepared as you probably could be. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm really curious, especially that you mentioned about um, this, uh, uh, this uh, health strategy in uh, Seattle, about the supplements, supplements, massages, and uh, the, the other ways to make sure that the body will be ready for a tough season and playing for really big aims. Because in uh, the age 28, uh, it was the last season when you played in the NBA in uh, in New Jersey Nets. I'm just curious, did you try to come back to the NBA and why did you uh, decide to retire in uh, such a young age? Maybe not yeah. the youngest uh, for the player, but still... Uh, in near to the to the prime and the moment that uh, you could uh, for sure play for other couple of seasons the bad injury or the moment that you felt that okay it's enough yeah I, I played seven years and it seemed like every year I tore something or I broke something and most years I'd try to play through it to the end of the season I had a year where I just wrapped a wrist that was broken and had to get surgery after the season because the bone and the wrist healed weirdly and I could pop it out of joint anytime I wanted. I had a uh, torn shoulder. Um, but what happened my last year in New Jersey was I ruptured, partially tore my calf and Achilles tendon. And I was about two weeks away from coming back when the season ended. And uh, I went back to Wisconsin and worked out there and uh, I had a teammate, Jamie Fike, who was a great guy, still is. <clears throat> and uh, he had bone spurs underneath an Achilles tendon that were too painful for him, for him to continue playing with. <clears throat> and he had, to, he had to get surgery to get the bone spurs removed. But they said, if you get this surgery, you might never play again. And he said, I'm at the point where I can't play with it the way it is now. So either I'm never going to play with it again because I have it, or I'm going to get rid of it and try to play again afterwards. And he had just signed a big contract. Um, so they went in and cut his Achilles tendon and got the spurs out, and he never came back to play again. And I had watched um, Kevin Duckworth in Washington and Ronnie Cycli in New Jersey, two guys who were at the end of their careers playing on teams that really didn't want them there. Uh, they didn't want them there because they had big contracts that they didn't want to pay. And um, the, their, their attitudes were what you would expect when they're surrounded by people who wish they weren't there. And not necessarily players, but certainly management. Uh, not even coaches, but definitely management. And they were trying to do everything they could to get rid of them. Kevin Duckworth had a weight clause and he had to weigh in. And if he was overweight, then he had to pay a fine and all kinds of stuff. They just make your life as miserable as they can. And I didn't feel like any amount of money was, was worth 
putting myself and my family through that and quite frankly, standing in the way of, of a team if they didn't feel like I was the right person for the team and they wanted to move in a different direction. Um, I, you know, I knew the Nets owed me a lot of money, but they, they wanted to make big changes and they couldn't do that if I was going to stay on the roster. And so they offered me a buyout. And I'll tell you, literally, it was September 10th, 2001, the day before 9-11. They offered me a buyout and uh, I took it. And my agent had passed away at that point. And Bill Strickland, uh, who used to work for David Falk, but was on his own at that point, was nice enough to hold my hand and kind of walk me through that process. Um, so I took a buyout on the last two years of my contract. Um, and the way that these buyouts work in the NBA <clears throat> is um, they owe you this money. But if you play basketball uh, while that buyout is in effect, you know, like let's say they owe you a million dollars and you go play for the Cleveland Cavaliers for a half a million, you'll get your million dollars. You'll get a half a million from the Cavaliers and you'll get a half a million from the bullet or from the Nets. But <clears throat> you won't get the million dollar buyout plus another half a million on top of that. So essentially, when you take a buyout, it discourages you from playing again, at least while the buyout's in effect, because you're basically playing for free. You got to pay all your moving expenses to go, you know, wherever you're going. You got to pay to, you know, either stay in a hotel or, or rent a home or buy a home and move your family and move your kids around and schools and all that. And the only way you'll make money is if you can land on a team that makes it to the playoffs and then you'll get a playoff share. And if you lose in the first round, at that time, I don't know, maybe you get $15,000. Um, and if you make the finals, you know, maybe you get 150000 or something. Um, so basically, it would cost you a lot of money to keep playing basketball. And so there's really no financial incentive for me to do it. And I, I also had the benefit of being active with the Players Association. And we had these summer meetings where we would invite the Retired Players Association to have their meeting at the same time in the same hotel. And I got to meet a bunch of retired players. And as I looked at those guys, it was like looking at a window into my future. And I saw the way that at 50 and 60 years old, they limped around like they were 80 years old. And I didn't want that for myself or my kids or my family. I wanted to, you know, a lot of guys play in the NBA until they physically cannot play anymore. And when, and this is the same thing for football and baseball hockey and when they leave their bodies are so broken down they can't stay in shape and and then you know they put weight on and they become unhealthy and it's just a downward spiral I didn't want that I wanted to leave while my body was still in, in decent shape and I think I accomplished that and I'm still able to go out and exercise and man I was scooping up a bunch of uh, grass out in the pasture for my horses the other day and I was pressure washing the enclosure on my swimming pool. And if I was, if I had stayed even another year, would I have torn something or blown something out? You know, would I have ruptured a disc in my back that would make any kind of physical labor like that very hard to do? Yeah. And the quality of life, you know, what good is it if you, if you have $50 million and, and you're in pain every time you move, you know, so there's, you have to look at that balance and, and not everybody sees it that way. I think I had better perspective because I tried to pay attention to as much as I could. Um, and I just, you know, I didn't, I didn't want that for my body or my family or, or any of it. Uh, basketball was important to me, but it wasn't that important that I'd, I'd give up the quality of my life potentially for the rest of my life to, to play another year or, or even, you know, half a season. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mentioned about uh, really interesting, interested and interesting and also really painful aspect of uh, NBA career. Of course, uh, not everyone could play in the NBA and uh, you got a chance to earn a money, sometimes really big money. You could become a millionaire, but not everyone who play in the NBA got this opportunity. But uh, there is also something which is uh, outstanding uh, outside the stage, uh, uh, we as a fans many times see only the statistics, uh, some moments, some emotions, but uh, there are hours uh, in the training room, uh, there are hours uh, when you prepare your body for the next game, for the next season, and each season is uh, 
tougher than it was at the beginning of the, your career when you got uh, 20 or 21 years old. So uh, when we are talking about life after basketball, you mentioned it about horses, about swimming. Uh, how looks uh, Jim Michael Vine uh, life after basketball and NBA? It's it's pretty good. Um, I'm not really into horses, but my wife is. So by default, I am, and I have to help take care of the horses. And I'm trying to plant grass right now because in Florida, the Bahia grass goes dormant in the winter and dies. And uh, the rye grass will grow in the colder winter months. But I had to put down 150 pounds of seed in one of the pastures. We're going to try it this year to see if it works and drag the field and do all that kind of stuff, put some lime down. Um, so that's nice. And I, you know, I, I feel like I'm in as good a shape as I, I was when I retired. Achilles is pretty much, I have some mile on body, but I, I don't move around in pain. And I know that's not the case for a lot of my former teammates and guys, colleagues, I guess, that I played in the NBA with. A lot of them have pain. And, you know, it, it saddens me to see the shape that some of them are in now uh, because they just, it's too painful for them to try to stay in shape. And it's too easy to eat more than they should or eat things they shouldn't eat or, you know, have some drinks and whatever. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm 49 years old now and I have a four-year-old. So I was, and, but I also have a 23 year old. So I've got a big gap with a lot of my kids and I feel like one of my most important jobs now is to try to stay alive as long as I can, um, to try to be there for my kids so I can walk my daughter down the aisle when she wants to get married. Uh, so I can meet my grandkids, but I started a podcast called the Marked Men podcast with one of my, uh, uh, a guy, John Scott Lewinsky, who went to Marquette with me. Mm -hmm. And uh, the main reason I did that is because I think podcasts are a great medium, and you probably agree with this, to capture moments in time that can live on forever, well beyond our lifespan. So I, I realistically don't expect I'll, I'll get to know some of my grandkids really well, if at all. But my hope is that they'll hear me on your podcast or my own Marked Men podcast or some other podcast that I went on. And they'll get to have a glimpse into their grandfather or their great grandfather's life that I never had. Um, my, my dad was in his 40s when he had me. He was born in 1930. I was born in 1972. And my grandfathers both died probably in the 1960s, if not the 1950s. Um, but, I, you know, what I wouldn't give to hear one 30-minute conversation that my grandfather had with somebody, I think that'd be such a tremendous gift to have. So hopefully, um, if my grandkids and, and great-grandkids never get to know Grandpa Jim or great-grandpa Jim, they can listen to your podcast or something else and, and get a glimpse into his life. And uh, I just hope Hope that's not the case. Hope I, I get to know them all really well, but I know realistically, you know, at some point we all have to leave. So um, I'd like to leave a little bit behind that they they can learn a little bit more about their family from uh, that that I didn't have the opportunity to do with my family. Yeah, for me also the, the new technologies, of course, they've got also shadows, but uh, it's an opportunity to uh, make dreams come true and. Uh, uh, one, uh, I remember that one uh, person told me that when you, when he looks at uh, my podcast and my guests, that uh, it looks like uh, the path which is uh, signed by NBA cards, upper decks, and flares, and, and it's true. You know, I remember that when I start uh, interesting in the NBA in the middle of nineties. Most of NBA players I know from the TV, but also from the NBA cards. And suddenly the, there is opportunity to talk with you, to talk with Tim Hardaway, or with some Perkins, with uh, players who I know only from this analog, uh, uh, analog um, uh, uh, ways to get information about uh, the, the NBA. But uh, I'm also curious. Uh, do you've got still the contact with the basketball? For example, you are coaches in some high school team. For no, no, for sure, not for your daughter, but uh, do you've got uh, any contact with uh, the basketball NBA besides sometimes maybe watching uh, it on TV or internet? Um, a few years after I retired from the NBA, 
um, Marquette offered me the opportunity to do the radio for the Marquette basketball games where I went to college. So I did that for oh, like 13 or 14 years. So that was nice because I, I got to stick around the game. I didn't have to go to practices. I just went to the fun part. I went to the games and I prepared, but I didn't have to prepare as much as I did as a player or as I would as a coach. And so I got to spend a lot more time with my family, which is important to me because you don't spend your NBA career locked up in a gym and traveling all the time. So you don't see your family when you retire. You want to spend more time with them. Um, so I stuck around basketball for that. I go to the retired player. They have a retired NBA Players Association. Um, and we have meetings. I didn't go to the meeting last summer in Las Vegas because of coronavirus. I just, I'm trying not to travel if I don't have to. I'm trying to be a little more cautious. Um, they, they had it. And, and so I'll, I'll still see guys there or I'll just run into guys here and there. Like uh, um, I live in Florida now and there's a lot of guys in Florida because there's no state income tax and it's nice weather. And where I, I have a home in Wisconsin, Joe Wolf is in the same County. Mm -hmm. So I talk to Joe periodically and I, you know, we have dinner every once in a while and see each other. And um, so you, you, we keep in contact. Twitter has been really nice for that. It's allowed me to connect with a lot of guys that some of them I, I played with, some of them I played against and didn't really know that well. And I've gotten to know like a guy like Eldridge or Kasner a lot better. And he and I have fun going back and forth on Twitter all the time. And he's a real estate agent out in, in Seattle now and, and doing pretty well with that. And it's, it's nice to be able to keep up with guys. And sometimes it's not good. I'm sure you saw Cedric Sabalas got sick yes. with COVID and had the mask on and all that. And so you hate to see guys fall into states like that, but I, I think he recovered. But it's nice to be able to kind of keep up with people and, and still stay in contact with folks that you really like, even if you don't talk to them every day or even every month. You know, I get to follow Detlef Shrimp on Twitter and I can see all the great and LinkedIn, all the great things he does for charities and raising money. And he's like one of the most inspiring guys I've ever been around because he does so much for philanthropy. He, he had a foundation that raised over $30 million for community, uh, for charities in the Seattle area. And one of the frustrating things for me is not just as a player where fans gravitate towards statistics and, and don't understand the, the non-statistical things. Like you'd never be able to tell me who led the league and charges drawn in any season because nobody keeps track of that. But that's a hugely important statistic because the other team, a player picks up a foul, you get a guaranteed possession. And so it's a, it's a huge uh, swing. Um, so people, you know, miss out on that. And, and I feel like they don't value professional sports teams the same way. They look at, you know, maybe the, how much an arena costs to build to keep a, a team in there. And, and maybe they'll look at the payroll and the taxes that the team pays and payroll and, and see that benefit. But what they, they'll never look at, and you'll never hear cited when they talk about the value of having a professional sports franchise is, is the philanthropy of it. And where I grew up in Wisconsin, John McLaughlin used to play for the Bucks and started the MAC Fund, Midwest Athletes Against Childhood Cancer. And he's raised millions and millions of dollars for childhood cancer. And the list just goes on and on. So uh, a lot of these athletes do some great things with their, their fame and their notoriety in terms of fundraising and, and raising money for communities and charities that uh, unfortunately goes unaccounted for when when people talk about the value of having a professional sports franchise in their city so uh, debtless probably one of the biggest shining examples of that last question uh, if you could create uh, all-time uh, Jim McElwine teammates team uh, who would you pick you mentioned uh, we mentioned about some hall of famers about your former uh, Sonics and uh, Bullets and Nets uh, uh, teammates, but who would you pick uh, for your teammates team? Would it, would it be guys that I played with? Yes. And, and would would it be when I played with them or when they were in their prime? Oh well, when you play with them. Okay. It could so be by like, position or just the top five players. Yeah, I played. It's up to you. Price and, and Scott Skiles, but they were at the end of their careers when I played with them. So I guess my point guard would be Gary Payton. Um, 
my shooting guard, I think I would go with Hersey Hawkins, probably. Small forward. Um, I think Sean Kem could play small forward for me. Mm-hmm. And then I'd put uh, Chris Weber at power forward. And then who would I have as center? Um, I mean, I, I would obviously like to play, but I, I got to believe George Marison would have played better and probably put up better numbers than I would have. Um, so I would have been happy to come off the bench on that team. Mm-hmm. Or the coach of that team. Well, no, no, I wouldn't <laughs> want to coach the team. That's for sure. I, I, you know, I might pick somebody like Jimmy Lyon to be the coach. Mm -hmm. Jim, it was my last question. Thank you all very much for this great uh, conversation and opportunity to talk not only about uh, those uh, popular NBA aspects of the game and being a player, uh, about uh, history of your contract uh, with the Sonics and also about uh, uh, your struggle uh, with injuries and uh, life after NBA. So it was really great opportunity to talk and uh, I would again I would like to uh, thank you for your time uh, in uh, spent with me and uh, in my podcast well, I appreciate the opportunity and, and be sure to let me know when it goes live and then I'll, I'll share it on Twitter and Facebook and sure I will, I will be really grateful thank you very much okay. and have a nice day you. goodbye Bye.